Well, thank you, Senator Boner, for meeting up with us. We really appreciate it. Um, how's the campaign going so far? The campaign is going great. Uh, really energized and enthusiastic. Every day is a new adventure and um, having a lot of fun. Uh, we have a, uh, we picked a running mate, uh, Millie Silva, and I'm sure you'll be asking me about that. But, uh, you know, that's the most recent uh, thing that's happened that is of uh, momentous uh, decision and um, very, very thrilled about it. Excellent. Excellent. Um, I'm a lifelong New Brunswick resident, and our newspaper, we're just obsessed with New Brunswick. Everything to do with New Brunswick and stuff. So, I love New Brunswick. Do you? I was going to ask you, what are some of your best memories in New Brunswick? Well, uh, when I graduated Rutgers Law School in Camden, I, I uh, moved from uh, South Jersey to um, uh, Highland Park because my first job was as a, a law clerk at the courthouse. And so that's when I just first became acquainted with New Brunswick, our county seat in Middlesex County. And from there, I just never left. My second job, my, uh, I became a public defender after that. And we were on the corner of Bayard. I'm not sorry, we're on the corner of uh, Livingston Avenue and New Street. That's where it used to be. And so I was back and forth to the courthouse. And then from there, we opened um, a law practice, a private law practice on Livingston Avenue. Oh, no, it was first it was on the corner of Bayard and George, and then we moved to Livingston Avenue, so, you know, and now here we are at my campaign headquarters, right in Livingston, right in the heart of New Brunswick, and boy, has it changed over the last 20 years. Excellent. Uh, do you have any favorite places in New Brunswick that you like to visit? Other than headquarters right here? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love Evelyn's. Uh, it's a great restaurant. Um, that's probably my favorite. I love sitting outside and uh, go to Sparks for my hair. Oh, okay. <laughs> It's a, you know, a lot of great restaurants here in New Brunswick. Very cool. Um, in regards to the upcoming election, mm -hmm. what do you think are the biggest differences between you and Governor Christie? Where do I begin? Okay. Uh, well, what people will find out is that they will, you know, have someone uh, as a governor in Barbara Buono and Lieutenant Governor Millie Silva who care about the middle class and the working poor. That is our priority. This is a governor whose policies have just turned his back on on the 99% of New Jerseyans and uh, favored the very wealthy at the expense of everyone else. And so they will know that Barbara Bono and Millie Silva are people that will have their back, will go to back, back for them. And that's because, you know, Millie and I understand the struggles people are experiencing because we live them. You know, I, my dad was a, an immigrant. I, he came here when he was three, didn't speak a lick of English, and uh, we settled in Nutley, uh, lived up in, in, as Millie did, in. Uh, uh, you know, poor circumstances, and both of us had the opportunities to, you know, with hard work and then somebody giving us a chance to lift ourselves up, we're able to get a good education, and uh, you know, we wouldn't be here without those opportunities that New Jersey gave for us, and really that's what it's all about. For me, it's about creating the opportunities that I had growing up, and, uh, you know, so that we can create good paying jobs right here in New Jersey so that our kids can stick around. Uh, so speaking about uh, poverty, um, mm -hmm. As governor and with Millie as lieutenant governor, what, what would you do specifically to combat, I guess, the rising poverty in New Jersey, especially in cities like New Brunswick? No, absolutely. You know, the uh, as we know, New Jersey has the highest unemployment in the region. When I say the region, not just New York, Pennsylvania, Connecticut, Delaware, and uh, you know, people need jobs. They're struggling. One of the first things I would do is I would assign a minimum wage increase and tie it to a cost of living. I would not have cut. Taxes. I would I've not raise taxes on the working poor as this governor did by cutting the earned income tax credit, which is a, a, a tax assistance for the working poor. I would create jobs in New Jersey. I'd have a real economic plan that focused on investing in our workers of today and our, by retraining them for the jobs that are in demand, the new, the good paying jobs, the new highly skilled jobs, and on the workers of tomorrow, our students. I'd invest. In higher education, I would invest in K through 12 to make sure that our students not just have those skills that they needed once they graduated high school, because as you know, everybody doesn't have to go to college, but also make sure that our colleges have the resources to uh, uh, give the, our kids the training they need, and also to keep tuition affordable. You know, when I went to Montclair State and Rutgers Law School, I couldn't have done it if tuition was out outpaced the people's wages as it does today, and I still couldn't do it. I had to have assistance, tuition assistance, work study. I had a national defense student loan in law school, and I didn't have to start paying it off until I was out of law school for a year. So that's four years without paying the loan off, and then it's 3% interest. But I also had to use another loan, um, a Howard Savings Bank. I didn't even have the 500 bucks to deposit to qualify. 
and I borrowed it, but I did it, and I did it because tuition was affordable back then, and there were jobs to pay off the loans when I graduated. I, I'm sure you know of people that, A, don't even go to college or graduate school because they're afraid they'll be in such deep debt that their credit rating will be hurt for the rest of their lives, and, and you know, that's not a good thing. We have to have a job so that kids feel that they can get the training, education, and preparation that they need to succeed. You can tell I feel strongly. Oh, it's oh yeah, a huge I issue understand. for me because I know. I have loans for my grads. So. Well, yeah, I know I wouldn't, you know, I'm under no illusion that if I didn't have the opportunities that were given to me living here in New Jersey, that I would not, have, not just have become a lawyer, but be running for governor of the state of New Jersey. So I feel very fortunate that I grew up in a state like that. Excellent, excellent. Um, governor Christie has been widely credited with showing leadership in response to Hurricane Sandy. As governor, if like if you were governor, what would you do differently from what he did, and what are your plans to address the effects of climate change throughout the state and nation? When you when you say what what would I do different than he did with respect to Sandy, or in terms of just general leadership? Uh, specifically on his handling of the aftermath of the storm. Okay. Well, I can tell you, going into Sandy, I would have handled it differently. I would have followed the experts. You know, this governor, it's a reflection of him being a denial of climate change. I was the uh, prime sponsor of the Global Warming Response Act and a big advocate of New Jersey staying in the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, which, as you know, reduced greenhouse gas emissions and created green jobs. This governor unilaterally withdrew New Jersey out of that. Um, what I would have done is I would have followed the experts who said they knew the storm was coming. And what we should have done is we should have moved our, our, our trains to higher ground as New York did. And instead we have um, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of damage that we could have avoided, number one. Number two, we knew before Sandy hit that we were having these um, much more extreme and frequent weather patterns. We knew from Hurricane Irene, the ice storm after that. What he should have done is uh, planned better and uh, done what other states like Connecticut did and uh, gone out to bid, figured out and, and um, negotiate the best price for um, someone to do cleanup. In the aftermath, of this, he didn't, but he listened to his buddy Haley Barber, former uh, governor of Mississippi, who was Chris Christie's mentor. And Chris Christie said that if he would, wasn't for Haley Barber, he wouldn't be governor of the state of New Jersey. Haley Barber calls Chris Christie a couple days before the storm's coming and says, hey, I got a great deal for you. The state of, of, of Connecticut has a list of vendors, and why don't you hire Ash Britt, who Haley Barber just so happens to be a lobbyist for. So without any question, without any negotiation, he says, sure. So we know that we have this no-bid contract that is charging sometimes double the price that other towns have for cleanup in the aftermath of Sandy. So those are two things I would have done differently going into Sandy. In the aftermath of Sandy, what I would have done is I wouldn't have just had press conferences and ribbon cuttings on the boardwalk. I would have made sure that ever that we had the day after, as soon as we were on our feet again, I would have sat down with every mayor, with every county, and had a, a plan specific to every municipality. This governor did not do that. He waited and waited to see what FEMA was going to hand down to us. We need people need to have answers. You know. There are people who are so many people that, that live uh, not within uh, a view of the boardwalk that I just went to visit Union, Union Beach, for example. People are living in trailers still. They're getting no answers from the Department of Community Affairs, and they're trying to get assistance. It's a, it's a complex, complicated maze, and this governor has not helped real people in need, so there's no, they're really in the same situation that they were in the immediate aftermath of Hurricane Sandy. That should not be. Uh, back in December, Governor Christie cited your opposition to Martin Perez's appointment. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you feel now that Mr. Perez has joined the Rutgers Board of Governors? Well, you know, this governor has, uh, I know there's a, a, a legal case going on that, and uh, you know, I haven't really weighed in on the merits of it. That's something for the court to decide, and this is a, uh, a, an appointment that the governor uh, made without the, the senatorial uh, courtesy, and uh, you know, we'll see what the courts decide on that. Uh, you also said that you were against Senator Sweeney's bill to abolish the Rutgers Board of Trustees. Yes. Do you think that the governor is behind this effort? I have no idea. It doesn't matter to me. I really don't spend a second of time knowing what the governor's behind or not. But I will tell you what, what, what I am sure, certain of. I think that, uh, you know, I'm very concerned as a Rutgers alumna that this will so politicize. I don't see the need for it. I mean, if you, if you look at 
the way other institutions are run. There are the ones that are so politicized, like I think will happen if, we, if it's purely governor's appointments on the board of governors. I think this could ser seriously jeopardize uh, Rutgers' future in terms of drawing down uh, grants. I know that I've talked to alumni that are, um, that are very concerned that have said that they will stop contributing to Rutgers if that happens. Uh, I, I, you know, I'm actually in the middle of, of, of writing something on it, and I'll be publishing. We'll hopefully, send it to you guys, and you'll and you'll publish it also. Uh, what is your position on in-state tuition equity for New Jersey's undocumented students? Well, you know, I w as I said, I would. I feel very strongly. I'm a sponsor of, of the bill, and uh, when I was chair of the budget committee um, during the last governor, I um, insisted that the bill be posted. We voted it out of my committee. Uh, but it was never posted for a full vote before the Senate. We're hoping that this, we can get it out of the Senate, and uh, it, 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 the prospects don't look good. But I have to tell you, if, I feel very strongly. Um, like I said, if I didn't have uh, affordable tuition, I wouldn't be here today, and every, every student should have that option. And, so, uh, and, and it's not only morally the right thing to do, if you need a fiscal reason to do it, it makes fiscal sense too, because we have 400,000 out of work, the middle class has shrunk in New Jersey. Poverty is up, and so don't. I think we need to, you know, create the most opportunities to to make sure that people have good jobs to grow the economy, and that and that would enhance that. So, in regards to I guess student debt rising in general, do you have any specific plans that would make I guess universities, and colleges in New Jersey a bit more affordable? Yes, I do. Uh, a number of things. One, in terms of parents' uh, saving, I have a piece of legislation in. Um, that would give parents upfront tax deductions for saving uh, to, to encourage them to save. This is something I have passed the legislature of Governor vetoed. Uh, NJ Best, it's called. In terms of uh, making tuition more affordable, I think we need to re you know, just go back to where we were and start seeing and um, demonstrating by our investment that higher education is key. Uh, not just to the, the economy, but just for, for the future, for our kids having the opportunities that they need. Uh, so I would, I'd like to see a stable source of funding instead of every single year. You know, when I was, I've been on the budget for a long time. I was budget chair. And every single year when, you know, we have diminishing revenues coming into the state, it seems as though higher education is always one of the first things to be cut. And I think it should be one of the last things to be cut. So I'd like to, you know, what I tell people is I will be the, the education governor, the higher education, just the education governor in general. And what that means is we need to uh, you know, get back to a point in New Jersey where our investment in education reflects that it is a top priority. Great. Um, Senator, I want to ask, uh, I think we're still, still haven't heard from the governor on the Supreme Court decision about the voting rights act. Um, how do you feel that the governor has in common with you? You obviously have a strong opinion. I do, I do, because I feel very strongly about uh, you know our, our voting rights, our, our civil rights. This is a this uh, the voting rights legislation is the signature, one of the signature accomplishments of the civil rights movement. You know when Lyndon Bain Johnson signed it with Martin Luther King at his side, and so many people have given their lives to protect and create a, a, an atmosphere where people weren't afraid to vote. I mean, I, I have to. You know, really question: you know, this is, is this really 2013 that we're refighting this battle where you know people had to face uh, impediments or obstacles to voting? You know, I remember reading about the days when people had had literacy tests before they could vote, had to pay a poll tax, and um, you know, when it's interesting that when uh, Barack Obama was up for re-election, all of a sudden we have all of these um, uh, voter voter ID laws that people are, are passing, and um, I, I think that. Uh, you know, I think the best laid plans, uh, thank God they didn't come to pass, but it was a little too close for comfort for me. And all of a sudden, just Chief Justice Roberts writes this opinion saying that, oh yeah, the days of Jim Crow are gone, so we don't need to have any oversight of these states that have essentially legitima legitimized bigotry. And, um, you know, so gutted the, the Voting Rights Act. And, you know, I think that for this governor to this is somebody who's not averse to giving his opinion, when it, even when it's unsolicited. And now it has been solicited on at least three occasions, and he's been extremely dismissive, saying, oh yes, I was in my car, I can read just so much. I was reading the Comptroller's report, I think. And then one time he said he was on vacation. And you know, it's, it's just reprehensible, I think. And this is someone who, in his mind, at least, would be president. And for somebody who has those aspirations to, to not have an opinion or not think it's important enough 
to frame an opinion on an issue as fundamental to democracy as voting rights, I think speaks volumes about his, his future. So what do you think could be better about New Jersey's access to the ballot? Like I know there's uh, been attempts to expand early voting. Yes. I've heard you speak forcefully about that on the floor of the Senate. Mm -hmm. um, there's also a lawsuit that would, uh, you know, try to, to make it so the state offers the option to do same day voter registration instead of having to register 21 days in advance of the election. How do you feel about those reforms? And what do you think we could do better as, as New Jersey? Well, we need a governor that would actually sign them. And this governor has shown that he, he refused to sign the early voting legislation. Uh, Nia Gill's legislation is just a, it would have gone a long way to increasing a voter participation. Uh, this governor vetoed it, say, citing that it was too expensive. So he's not, interesting, he's not willing to invest money in increasing voter turnout, but he doesn't hesitate a moment when he's spending untold millions of dollars on a senseless special election for the United States Senate to fill Frank Lautenberg's seat instead of having it, as you know, on the same date as the gubernatorial and all the legislative freeholder races on November 5th, Tuesday, November 5th, we're having it 20 days before that, on a Wednesday to boot. It's costing the taxpayers money. It's going to increase, uh, it's going to increasingly disenfranchise people because they don't know about the, I mean, you talk to people and we are trying to make sure people know about it and they just don't. So you need to have a governor that has uh, uh, that as a priority and unfortunately this governor does not. You have experience with law enforcement here in Middlesex County. Um, you know, in New Brunswick, we've had issues with police misconduct. And, mm -hmm. uh, do you think that it's inherently a conflict of interest to have uh, the county prosecutor's office handle matters that are basically investigating local police in that same county? Well, I, you know, I know that there was an issue recently, particularly in Edison, and the, the county prosecutor was, that was an extreme situation. And I know the county prosecutor was called in to uh, investigate, and uh, it seemed as though nothing changed in that instance. So I know that there was, under certain circumstances, I think that it, it, it merits uh, outside uh, oversight, and in that case, it certainly did. Um, also on the topic of law enforcement, uh, you know, Joe Spacuzzo pled guilty. Um, you know, what's your reaction to his, his guilty plea? And, and you know, this stuff was in the newspaper 15 years ago. Uh, why, why did you think that it took so long for the, the judicial system to, to take action? I have no idea. I, I will tell you that if somebody um, breaks the law, uh, as he obviously did, that they should be punished to the fullest extent of the law. Um, also wanted to ask you, uh, First time I met you, I was down lobbying in Trenton, wanted to uh, um, stop a, a really bad bill that was going to affect us here in New Brunswick. Uh, right. It was uh, basically, you know, I it, remember it, it, it made it so that we'd have to wait 10 years to run a ballot question mm -hmm. instead of what it used to be like three or four years was the, the legal statutory limit. And, and I know that, uh, uh, you know, somehow you ended up voting for that bill, even though you said you were against it. And I just want to know if, uh, if that's something you'd be willing to to say that you don't, don't support and that you would change it if you could? Well, I think 10 years is, is, is far too much, but I, uh, that's where you guys come in. We rely, That was at the end of a session, as I recall, right? Where we have a, you know, like a deluge of legislation, which really does not benefit the de democratic process. And that's why you are such a resource to legislators, because, you know, as much as we try and be on top of every issue, this is something that you unfortunately didn't weigh in soon enough. I think it was after the fact that we talked, and I, and I think that we, a lot of us reevaluated our positions on that. Yeah, we, we kind of got stuck. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, and, and just uh, one last question I, I have to ask. Uh, can you tell us about your involvement with uh, Women for Good Government? Uh, it was a political action committee that I uh, think Amy Pappy was uh, involved in. I'm sorry, I don't know about it. Tell me. It's, it's called Women for Good okay. Government. It was, I mean, um, it was covered heavily beginning uh, last April. Uh, some of these political action committees that were seem to be operating as uh, conduits mm -hmm, for, mm -hmm. for the funds. And this was one of them, and I believe you know, the campaign got some money from, from that organization. I also, you, you worked with Amy Pappy in the past, right? Uh, yes, you worked for me years ago, yeah. I, I have no recollection of receiving any funds, but if we did, if the record showed that, then we did. But beyond that, I don't know anything about it. Fair enough. Um, thank you so much All for right. taking the time. and uh, it's. Uh, it's really good that uh, somebody's willing to sit down and talk about this. Absolutely. Anytime. I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks Thank for having me. Thank you so much, Senator.